Okay, I'm Roger, VK4YB, and uh, we're going to talk about 630 metres and 2200 metres, which have been released since, I think, about 2012. But uh, it's only really come big time last year when the Americans got access to the band. We got hundreds of uh, keen guys there because they released it for general class and above, and they released it for single side band as well, which was a bit of a surprise. So those guys are now working towards work to all the states, and I believe the stations are up to 40 states already, so I expect they get somebody who's going to get work to all states this year. <coughs> okay, now, what is possible on, uh, on a low frequency band, that's a 2200 meter band, uh, we call 630 NF, by the way. I know that 160 is technically the, an NF band as well, but we sort of bre put that in with the uh, HF bands. So when I say NF, I'm talking about 630, but this is 2200. You'll probably recognise that as the whisper screen um, with a decode on it. The exciting thing here is a little tiny little blur, but you can hardly see it, a little smudge actually. Uh, up on the right top hand corner, that is the world record being broken. Uh, previously, uh, the world record was um, 8,400 kilometres from Phoenix, Arizona into Japan, and this is when I heard the same Phoenix station in Australia, 12,000 kilometres. So, put a big, uh, and it's still the world record today, but this is only receiving, remember, this is not QSO. QSO modes are the really important things. <coughs> and it, it's quite easy to get a report uh, from Whisper, but it's only one way. It doesn't count as a QSO. So it doesn't count towards the, the world record. But pe people do have uh, world records for receiving as well. Okay, right. Now, let's have a look. Now, what's to avoid <laughs> is um, getting your antenna wire anywhere near the... Um, uh, vegetation, yeah, trees, branches, or human beings, or whatever, because the vo voltages are very high. Um, they can be up to 5,000 volts. And I asked myself the question, why is it so high on MF instead of HF? I mean, you're running the same power. This is 450 watts doing this. Oh, incidentally, we can run 10 kilowatts on 630. It's quite legal. We're limited by the radiated power, not by the transmitter power output. <coughs> And antennas, more than 1% efficient, are very difficult to get. So you can run 500 watts. You're never going to go above the 5 watt EIRP limit. Now this is running 450 watts. And I didn't really notice. This is at my house. And um, I noticed the SWR was just flickering around a little bit. <laughs> it took a while to burn through that tree. Uh, it's recovered now, the tree. But that was an insulated wire, too. But the reason why it's so much higher on MF is because the radiator resistance is much lower. And if you've got a tuned circuit with an L, a C, and an R, the Q is ever so much higher with low R. And the magnification of the voltages is much, much greater. You won't get this on HF. You know, you've got a 16 p p piece of wire on 20 meters and it's got 30 ohms of radiation resistance. That will have about 0.001 of an ohm on 630. Right, okay. now. Let's go on. <coughs> Did we miss one? No, okay. Go back. Receivers, right. Now, you've got to be able to listen on the band, first of all. And you can listen with wide coverage receivers, general coverage receivers. And they're not usually very good, I have to say, because they're compromised. You know, uh, for the HF bands, you need great high sensitivity. You don't need that for 630 metres. When I connect one of my antennas to my um, Alicraft K3, I've got an S9 plus 5 dB noise level normally. On a quiet night, it's S9. So sensitivity doesn't matter. The, the receiver has already been turned down about 60 dBs by the, uh, you know, the um, AGC. So wide coverage receivers, yes, but they're, uh, they're a bit disappointing in performance. Most of us live near a capital city, which means we've got to compete with 50 kilowatt ABC transmitter not very many uh, kilometers away. In my case, 6124QR is only 25 kilometers from me. And on my 900 foot long wires, it literally puts in volts on the antenna. In fact, I, if I connect a loudspeaker to the l antenna, you can hear it, the volume of it uh, the other side of the room. That's how much strength it puts in. So <coughs> as we're trying to uh, receive whisper signals that are by 25 dB below or 30 dB below noise level, you can see that the 
the variation, the dynamic range that a receiver's got to be able to handle is enormous. And that's why general coverage receivers uh, don't have enough filtering front end. You really need a receiver with a very narrow filter at 630 meters to get rid of all the rubbish before it hits any RF amplifiers or anything where there might be nonlinearity. And you can get nonlinearity in your antennas as well if you've got a bad joint. I've had that, I got tremendous noise one day, couldn't figure out why, and eventually found it was the antenna connection outside was, um, you know, got a little bit wet and it wasn't making good contact. And that would create tremendous amount of, of uh, cross modulation. <coughs> Okay, and the same thing applies to transceivers with wide coverage. I've got an Elecraft KX3, which is a really nice rig, but it's deaf as a post on 630s. It's, it's hopeless. Um, SDR receivers, they can suffer overload very easily as well. And they, they always cover the bands, though. Um, but the best way to go, the one I recommend, is a transceiver plus a transverter. And the transverters, you can, there's all kinds of kits for them. Some of them made in Australia, and they're all very good. They're not expensive. You pay maybe 70 bucks or 100 bucks at the most. You'll get a kit of parts, and you might have to put it in a box. But it, it will then work into your own transceiver, and you've got all the facilities of your transceiver then, all the, you know, the noise blankers and all the narrow bandwidth and all the rest of it, uh, for just adding a small transverter. <coughs> okay, sorry. And uh, transmitters. Oh, hang on, let's go back. Transmitters. Um, there are specialist transceivers now coming on that do have 630 meters with a good coverage. That's the Elecraft K3S. I think there's a TS590S, the latest version, has 630 meters on it. But they only give you a low level output. You know, they give you a one milliwatt output or something of that nature. So you've still got to build your own amplifier to get any signal out. Good for receiving. Transceivers with both way transverters, and that means a transverter that both up converts and, and down converts using the same crystal oscillator. So you've got true transceive on your dial if you've got one of those transverters. <coughs> you've also got low powered kits based on the, the Arduino and Raspberry Pi. I think for 25 bucks or 30 bucks, you can get on the bands, little kits, you know, and they're quite good fun. You get on, but they're low power. Um, and as I say, the transverter kits are available at low cost. And you could also modify your existing transceiver that some people have done, but I don't recommend that. And I don't recommend it for three reasons. First of all, capacitors, like ceramic capacitors, don't work well on, on 630s. Uh, the film capacitors do. If you're building your own, stick to PET, PET capacitors are excellent. Uh, and then the biggest problem is the um, ferrites. Ferromagnetic materials are used in all the uh, transmitters as the output stage, and it's difficult to get a ferrite that will cover all the way from 6 metres down to 630 or 2200. The ferrites don't cover that much. They usually use type 43 for HF. You need type 77 for 630, so the ferrites won't go all the way down. You'll be very disappointed with the output from your normal PA stage. And the third thing that's a problem is the pin diodes. M not many people know this, but pin diodes, of course, are used for all the switching between transmit and receive. Those pin dies don't work below one megahertz. They won't work on 630. You can get pin dies that will go down. They're very expensive and rare. You certainly don't want to replace all the pin dies in your rig. So anyway, I don't recommend mo trying to modify a transceiver. <coughs> Let's go on. Uh, receiving antennas, yeah, there are whole heaps of them. Most people use little loops, or there's the K9AY, these flagged U's and so on. Um, you'll have to look in the books to see what will fit in your garden, but they're directional antennas and they work pretty well. Then there's E-probes, they're funny little things, just like little whip antennas on a, on a car. And with a pre-amplifier, you know, it's good for, uh, I've heard of people, you know, going to a motel or something and they just put it up on the balcony and they can hear all over the place with one of those E-probes, for receiving only, of course. And of course, you can also use your existing antennas, dipoles and long wires, just connect it up straight to your transverter or to your 630 receiver, and you'd be surprised what you can hear on that. Right, now I just want to go on. <coughs> TX antennas, well, you've probably already got one, because if you've got a G5RV or an 80 meter dipole or anything like that, strap the feeders, and all you'll need then is a coil to resonate it on, on 630, rather like a, you know, on a, on a car, in a mobile whip, you can run on the higher frequency bands with a short antenna. 95% <coughs> are verticals. Um, well, the vertical radiation is the one that does all the good. Um, I've got a full-size dipole at home, and it's pretty hopeless. So I definitely can recommend verticals. That's the only way to go, really. 
Um, long wires can work. Yes, I've got 900 foot long wires that are, that are really good. And there's one that's just been invented now by W5EST. It's a top flight antenna. It's called the top fed delta loop antenna. It takes up less room than an 80 meter dipole. And you can, um, uh, and I've tested them out and they cross the Pacific Ocean real good. This is a fantastic antenna. It uses multiplication of power, uh, of current in the loop by s very carefully selecting the C and the R and, and the L in each leg. And um, you put in one amp and then around the loop is three amps, miraculously. And it does give you nine times, I mean, it really works. I mean, it's an incredible thing. And then there's the bottom hat, that's one I invented. That's the poor man's vertical, where instead of putting the, the big top hat at the top, which is very difficult to do because you've got to have lots and lots of supports, I, I take another wire and then I drop it down another tree and I have the big top hat actually just six feet above the ground. Um, it's much easier to do and, and everybody says, well, that won't work. Well, I, let me assure you it does work. It works extremely well. Okay. <clears throat> Now you've got to, I think we jumped one there. <laughs> coil winding. This is my coil winding. You'll see the good ones in a minute. <laughs> and now all those things there I bought in Bunnings for about 20 bucks. You know, just drill a hole. You could see the bits of PVC pipe, a couple of elbows, and you can make that thing drum that rotates. And it's, it only takes a couple of hours to put that together. And I tell you what, if you're going to wind any more than one coil, it's definitely worth the, the effort. Because <laughs> I wound that coil in just a few minutes. Whereas if you've tried winding them by hand, the whole thing comes undone and it's a mess. <laughs> now, some people have taken this to a fine art. It keeps jumping, there we go. Uh, that's serious coil winding. These guys are, are experts and they've got that on a lathe and, and they're winding that coil for the eight kilohertz band. Well, of course, we don't have eight kilohertz band. Here, so you don't need antennas as big as, or coils as big as that. Now, here's a typical 630 meter <coughs> setup, tuning setup. And uh, this is the one at ZF1EJ on the Cayman Islands. And uh, you can see he's got a fairly modest coil there. And he's also got a trimming capacitor, a uh, vacuum variable trimming capacitor. The, the uh, antenna goes on that white insulator at the top there. That's an earth connection there. And the um, coax comes in from the transmitter there. So that's a relatively easy one. I, I think he's got a, a Marconi antenna. I think it's about 60 foot high. And he's got a couple of, you know, T's on the top of it, and that's all you need to tune that. But you'll need a bigger coil if you've only got a small, like a 40 meter dipole, uh, maybe only 40 feet high, you'll need a quite a bit bigger coil than that. Radio, now then, let's have a look. Now, the enemy, QRN, yes, I'm afraid it does get very badly affected by QRN, the 630 meter band, and 2200. So we can't do much in summer. Um, right, okay, now you want to keep a track on where the lightning is when you start operating. And here is the blitzorgtung.org, comes out of Germany, and it shows you all the lightning in the world in real time, where it is. I took that one just the other night. <coughs> and it also, you can, you can expand up and just look at one continent, or just at Australia if you want. And you can see that at the moment, Australia is clear. But uh, Europe is pretty, pretty hectic up there at the moment. <coughs> Righty-o. And we keep jumping, don't we? There we go. Now, uh, here's a whisper chart uh, of my operation on one day last, it would have been sept September, October, which is the best time of the year at the equinox. And that's a typical evening's work there. You see ZF1EJ um, the, over there in the Caribbean. And then N3FL is in Maryland, I think, right on the East Coast. We've got some Midwest stations there. And we've got Alaska, we've got Hawaii, We've got Japan, we've got um, station in Western Australia, and of course the New Zealand stations. All of that is where we could cover on Whisper on a good, good night. Now this is a JT9 QSO here, and you probably can't read the fine print there, but that's where I was working VK3 WRE. He's not here today, is he? <laughs> VK3 WRE on uh, JT9. And there's also a little box here opened here. This is a chat room, the 630 meter chat room which you need to know what's going on. And um, uh, somebody is relaying information for me about him there. The chat room is, um, is ON4KST. And um, I'll just go on now and have a look. Now, the DX seasons, <coughs> March to April equinox. That's for long haul DX. This is when VK stations have been heard in Europe. 
The world record there is, is held by Dale, VK1DSH. He's been heard in France. And VK3ELV has been heard in France at this time of the year. I haven't got into Europe yet. Um, but I'm hoping to. And then the next season, May to August, we're in now. It's low noise season here in Australia, but Northern Hemisphere is plagued with storms, so it's very good season for VK, VK SSB. And there's nets on uh, 6.30 on sideband. And we can talk down, I've spoken to New Zealand and uh, Adelaide. I haven't got across to Western Australia yet. We need somebody keen there to come on 6.30 with, with SSB. <coughs> but I have been heard in Hawaii just recently, about a week ago, five and nine report from Hawaii on single sideband. 7,600 kilometers, so don't let people tell you you can't get anywhere on 6.30, you, you can. Now, the best time of the year, September, October, equinox. Um, it just seems to be the best time of the year. I, I just don't know why that equinox seems to be better than the other, but um, uh, the band really opens up, and you can get right across to the east, east coast. I'm hoping to get into South America. There's a keen guy in Venezuela, hasn't heard me yet. Uh, that should be path should be open. And of course, Japan is, is always there. And then the last season, November, February, which is, of course is our summer, uh, is, is um, November, February, is a, yeah, our summer. Yeah, good propagation to North America, but summer static is a problem, yeah. We don't hear them very well because we've got too much static, but they hear us. Now, now, where to start? There's a couple of websites you probably want to look at. 472kHz.org is the European website, and that's quite a small one, but it's got a lot of good stuff on it, actually. And probably the most well-known is KB5NJD, that's John Langridge, and he writes daily reports, so elaborate daily reports. He's got four or five pages of information every single day on what's happening on 6.30. There's so much going on. You've got to look up that. And he's also got lots of other articles on building stuff, another big section that's got links to other pages. So if you start with KB5NJ, if you, if you don't make any other notes today, uh, just write down KB5NJD and look at that, Google that, and you'll be on to all the stuff connected with 6.30. And the LF and MF chat rooms that I mentioned before, there's ON5KST is the main one, because to set up these SCEDs, um, you know, you really need to have a chat room to, to know what's happening at the other end. There's a 600 meter Yahoo group, which is the VK group, and uh, if you want to set up some, uh, you know, advance information on what's happening, if there's going to be an SSB net or whatever, that's a good one. And uh, I also added there the 6212 teacup um, net, which is a Japanese bulletin board. It's written in Japanese, but you can get the translation. And it's run by JH3 um, XCU Hideo, he's very, very keen. Radio, so that's where you need to start to, to find out all this stuff, what's available. Now, conundrums. <coughs> you see, what's interesting about 6.30 is it's a, it's a new band and we haven't discovered what all the propagation is all about. There's so many things happening we don't understand. I mean, spotlighting is one. What happens with spotlighting is that you're transmitting and a guy in, say, California is getting really strong in neg 17. And remember that whisper goes down to about neg 33, so that's way above threshold. And nobody else in his area is hearing you, and nobody else. Uh, just this one station, and he might, and then it might move, the spotlight might move a bit, and then it'll move up and say, the Canadians will start hearing you, but only just one or two, this tiny little area. We don't understand why that happens. People have suggested, oh, well, there's a concave section of E layer. It's mostly E layer, you know, the 6.30. <coughs> and it might be, you know, concave, so it's sort of like focusing the signal in. It doesn't really make sense because it, how would it last for an hour or so like that? That would be only lasting a few minutes. But these spotlights can stay in one place. I mean, that guy in uh, um, the Cayman Islands, ZF1EJ, I got a spotlight on him that lasted for about 40 minutes, and he just got really strong reports from me for over this 40 minute period and nobody else was hearing me at all it's very very odd so they've got spotlighting they've got another thing we call the mackerel sky we don't know how what this is and this is instead of a spotlight you get a, a, a situation where people are hearing you along a single corridor and they're hearing you quite strong all the way along this corridor but the people on either side are not and then you might find the next night that that corridor then just moves in angle it moves its angle 
and it's parallel paths because whilst I'm working these guys here, the New Zealanders will be working on another parallel path. So it looks like across the Pacific Ocean there are these corridors and that's why I call it the mackerel sky because if you're aware of the uh, phenomena, uh, there's little clouds that all line up and they also have another rows that go at 90 degrees to those or near 90 degrees and so ZL might be getting into Japan at the same time <coughs> but I can't. So you've got a mackerel sky, we don't know, we, don't, we have no idea why that is. Now the diode effect, <coughs> the diode effect as you would expect is one-way propagation. Now, you've probably heard a lot about one-way propagation on HF and usually it's because you know somebody's got a lot of high noise, you know you hear some guy calling CQ is strong as we won't hear you and you think, oh, one-way propagation. Well, it probably isn't. It's probably just he's got a lot of noise at his thing. But this, what we call the, the diode effect, happens every night on 630 metres. Uh, right after sunset, I hear the Americans coming in. I might hear the West Coast coming in, um, and then they'll fade away. Uh, and, and when I'm transmitting, they're not hearing me. It's one way. And then it'll switch over around about 9 o'clock, and then they start hearing me, and they fade out with me. I can't hear them, but then they start hearing me. And this isn't something that happens, uh, you know, just once in a while. It's almost every night this happens, a diode effect, and um, we don't know why that is. Um, some people say that's impossible. You've got to have reciprocity of antennas, reciprocity of paths. How, how can you have one way? But I think about a waveguide uh, isolator, for example. There's a component that's a passive. It's a linear device, but it only allows transmission in one direction, doesn't it? Um, it's actually a circulator with a, a port on it that's terminated. That's how the um, um, waveguide isolators work. And they use magnetic materials, magnetic materials to cause the circulation. Well, the, the Earth's magnetic field, and they use Faraday rotation. And I've, I've postulated that maybe the same thing can be happening here. If an area that is causing Faraday rotation is moving across the Pacific Ocean, to begin with, um, my signals go into it, and if it's saying giving a 10 degree rotation, um, it will be uh, re rotating to the right 10 degrees, so it'll, it'll, the signals will miss the other stations. But their, their path coming to me with a 10 degree rotation may come here. Now, as that, as that moves across, um, my signal will get to them, uh, because I've got the 10 degree rotation, uh, but their signal will come, it'll also be rotated 10 degrees, but away from me, if you consider it's not on the straight path. So that's one possibility of, of it, I, I don't know, but uh, anyway, uh, the diode effect we haven't really solved. And then a, another conundrum we've got is high directivity from long wire antennas. I've got wire antennas here which are extremely directional, they're 900 feet long, and you think, oh, it's long wire. It takes me 10 minutes to walk from one end to the other after I've slashed my way through the lantana and everything. So you think, oh, it's a long wire. It's not. 900 feet is less than a half wavelength. That's not a long wire. Um, so we call them long wires, but they're not really. So how can they have directivity when they're so short? It defies mathematics. The aperture of an antenna determines how fine the, the radiation pattern will be. When you've got such a tiny aperture, you, 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 you know, mathematically you can't. But I've proven over and over again that th they do have. When I transmit on my northeast beam, only the North American stations hear me. Japanese stations don't hear me. I switch to my Japan beam, all the Japanese stations hear me, but the North Americans don't. And they're both using identical 900 foot long wires, pointing directly at Japan and at the States. Now, it can't, you know, mathematically, nobody can explain how that works. But I got a little bit of an inkling because on certain nights, the di directivity disappears. And it doesn't matter which antenna I transmit on, both sides hear me. So it's not exactly to do with the antenna, it's to do with something else as it must be. <coughs> now, I'm going to end with this quotation from Yogi Berra. In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice. In practice, there is. <laughs> He's a <laughs> bit of a whip to Yogi Berra. <laughs> He's the New York Yankees coach, one-time coach. And he, you probably know about him. Anyway, <coughs> any questions? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> because it's an exciting band. You've done everything on, everybody's done everything on the HF bands. I mean, everybody's worked every country. On this, um, there's still countries not worked. No VK has ever worked any, any Asian station, right. waiting to be done. Sorry, yes. How much real estate do you need? 
<laughs> well, I, I've got 10 acres, okay? But I say with this W5 EST antenna I've been testing, it's as good as my big long wires. And it only takes up the room of an 80 meter light bulb. So don't be too put off by that. You can get good things. Yes, sorry? So with that blue antenna, yes. It's 70 feet high. 70, 70. 70. But he does say you can scale it down a bit and it will still probably work quite well. But yeah. I inherited a, uh, a tuning unit from the NDB. I was chucking them out of the unit. You know, so it tunes for about 30 kilohertz to about 80 kilohertz. It looks like it might be quite fun to use for it. Yes. Yes. Um, Definitely. Um, I did the NDB ATU over my family the ATUs tend to be just single coils in most cases. If you're lucky, you'll find you don't get a good match. And then you could put a transformer in. But that means your losses are high. I mean, my antenna's got about less than one ohm of radiation resistance. It matches into 50 ohms. So what does that mean? I've got 49, losses, 49 ohms of losses in the earth. And everything. So it, it, a big top hat on it, yes. And that's the NDBs. NDBs use that, that's correct, yes. And um, that's omnidirectional, as I said, non-directional beacon NDBs, yeah, absolutely. And they're a good marker too. There's one just above the 630 meter band, it's in the La Trobe Valley. You can just go up and see how good conditions are. Yes? Exactly. The f I'm glad you asked that question. That, that's interesting. 500 kilohertz, of course, was the marine um, uh, emergency network. And it was intended to work from you know, ship to shore when the, you know, over a couple of hundred kilometers maximum. And you always get these um, anecdotal uh, you know, stories from uh, marine operators saying, oh, I was in you know, the Bay of Bengal and I heard this station in New York as strong as anything. And, you know, <laughs> and it, it could go much further. But of course, it, it wasn't really intended to do that. And the other thing, oh sorry, yeah, question? The, um, a lot of your propagation effects you're seeing are uh, in fact nothing new. Um, there, a lot of work has been uh, done on in the scientific community um, and uh, when I worked right in the Australian Space Service years ago with uh, Dr. Leo McNamara, uh, a lot of that work has been done and he's, he's uh, uh, produced, produced a book which you can buy on Amazon certainly explains it. Both the mackerel sky um, and the parallel paths and the, and the one-way propagation. One-way propagation also occurs at, at, at higher frequency and, and as, the, as the terminator rotates around you, know, you get a tilt in the ionosphere and it will work in one direction and not, not in the other because of the dispersion of, of, the, of the wave in, in the other direction. So you know, it, it's, when you said all that, so we can Nothing new to me. Spotlighting is is more common than you think, um, and of course, it's all um, do this at six at six thirty meters because you're using the the E layer, you know, uh, over the over the whole path. Predominantly. And That's right. Yeah. 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 It also occurs. It also occurs. Uh, you know, on it, 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 It's very very common. That sort of thing. Yeah. There, and there and are some excellent professional papers written on it. Not because it's necessarily a, 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 a complicated. Yeah, most of the work was done. A lot of work was done on for broadcasting purposes because they're very interested in the ground wave coverage of their radio stations, and they're not really so much interested in in first hop or, or certainly not two or three hop uh, until they had you know the the um, Cold War and the radio free Europe was trying to get into uh, Russia and everything as being jammed by the Russians, and then they realized that if they pulled their transmitters back way off the Iron Curtain, they got much better, very much more difficult to, to jam them. So there was a bit of work done there on one and two hop uh, propagation as well. But yeah, there's some excellent um, professional papers written. Yep. Have you tried using uh, crystal on the Vista frequency? The, in the front of the receiver? Uh, a crystal? Yeah. Excellent idea. Uh, Definitely, it, because it, it, it will be very, very narrow. It's difficult to get crystals at that frequency. You can get ceramic um, resonators, though, for that frequency. Yeah. Yep. 
you've got to use very good high voltage insulators, yeah, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually cut off a few branches, you know, the, yeah, these high. So, so <laughs> I have found there's a domestic uh, wire you can get in Bunnings or whatever, and it's double insulated. They've got the copper, then the red PVC, and then they've got the white PVC. Do you know the one I mean? Uh, well, I found it's okay for my. Uh, if I'm using that, it, it won't burn through like you saw before. Uh, only single insulator. <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 I don't like that PVC stuff anyway, but no, yeah. No, no. <laughs> Perfect segue, speaking of high voltages. So what protections do you take for static build-up of these long ends? Is it just like a coil? Yeah, well, they, they, they're usually grounded through the coil, so there's a direct, there's a DC connection to ground yeah. normally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <coughs> absolutely. Um, yes, yeah, so I didn't mention right early on that, of course, nobody's got DXCC on on 6.30, that's all waiting to be done. Nobody's worked all continents yet. Uh, right? <laughs> and, um, and the world distance record on, on 6.30 metres for a QSO is 2, 000, uh, sorry, 12,002 kilometres. And that's between me and a guy in Washington State who's got a very good signal. So as most VKs are further away from this guy than, than I am, all you've got to do is hear him and you'll have the world record. <laughs> We're doing a lot of um, experiment with all these the propagations. So there's a few holes in Australia where we're not getting any signal reports. So we'd really like a few more people to come on. Uh, the most people are in Melbourne and Sydney. We've got people there. But, but it would be nice to have some in the, you know, up in North Queensland. Or that sort of <coughs> so I do encourage you to have a go on the band. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I've had more, f I've been licensed for 53 years and I've had more fun on 6.30 than on any other bands that I've had. And if you want to do a world distance record, I think you'll have to go up to about 60 gigahertz or something. <laughs> you know, it's pretty difficult. But you can do it on 630 or 2200 meters. Yes, question. It, it, sorry, is there, is there any comparison in the um, well, propagation? Are the same way? Is there any significant difference between those two bands other than the size of the components and more risk of burning trees? Yeah, yeah. 2200 is more difficult to get further away. And the propagation is rather di different as well. And you can get quite long distances on 2200 during daylight, which you can't on 630. So the, the propagation is quite a bit different on 2200. So more ground wave propagation rather More ground wave. But it's good at night, as I say, yeah. Um, I've got over to New Zealand on 2200, but that's as far as I've got on 2200. <coughs> yeah. So, yeah, as I say, please get on the band if you can. We need more operators. <laughs> Although there's about 25 VK stations on every night. Okay. Thanks for listening. To me.